So uh, my name is Josh Collinsworth. Um, I work at Flywheel here in town, um, but I don't really want to talk about tech or design, which is what I usually talk about. Uh, I'm going to give you a grown-up book report. Uh, and, I, and I named the talk this because I, I read this book a couple of years ago um, uh, called David and Goliath. It's by Malcolm Gladwell, and it's really stuck with me, and I really appreciate the ideas in this book. Um, and I just want to talk about it. And as I got going on this presentation, I realized like 85 to 90 percent of it was just me telling what was in the book. So I'm, this is your grown-up book report. I'm just going to discuss uh, these ideas that are in the book. So um, the, one of the central foundations of the book is this question, uh, and, and take a second to think about it. Like, we tend to think about things in our lives as, if I have more of this, it's better, or if I have less of this, it's better. Um, things like, uh, for example, um, go ahead. Like, okay, so this is what this looks like if you were to put it in like mathematical formula, like, like up and to the right. The more, the better. Like we just want this thing in our life to go up and to the right. And the mathematical, if you're, if you're into math, I don't know, but that's x equals y. Uh, the more I have of one thing, the, the, the better it is. Uh, so this might look something like, uh, if I have more money, it's going to be easier for me to raise kids. This is an assumption that I think we probably all make uh, easily. Uh, if I go to a better quality of school or a more prestigious school, I'm going to have a higher likelihood of being successful. Uh, if we are tougher on crime, we are going to have a more peaceful society. And, if, and, and, and inversely, all of these, like, Inverse, too. If we have a peaceful society, that means we're tough on crime, right? X equals Y. We make this assumption about lots and lots of things. Um, we also actually make the opposite assumption, where we think that the less of something we have, that's going to be better, such as, um, and, oh, and this would be X equals negative Y, or negative Y equals X. If you're into math, if you're not, don't worry. Here's some examples. Uh, the less, the better. Go ahead. Uh, if I have less stress in my life, that's going to be better, and I will have more happiness. And the more happiness I have, the less stress I will have. Uh, if I have less failure, I have more success. And more success I have, the less failure I have. Uh, here's one that people make an assumption about a lot, which is the lower the student-to-teacher ratio, the higher the quality of education is going to be in that classroom. Um, I have good news and I have bad news. As you probably have guessed, all of those examples are total lies. None of those are actually true. Not a single one of them. Um, x almost never equals y, and x is almost never inversely proportional to y. If you want to say it in math, but there's really no such thing as just something that's always good, and there's really no such thing as something that's always bad. Um, the truth is that life is more complicated than that. Um, what we think of as good and bad is very subjective. So as an example, um, is it good to be protective of children? I think faced with that question, most of us would say, yes, of course we've got to protect children. Like, they're, they're young, they're innocent, they could hurt themselves. But then at the same time, is it always good to be protective? Like, if I asked the question a different way and said, uh, sure, protecting children from some things is good, but uh, isn't, if I said, isn't it good to sometimes make, let children make their own mistakes, you'd probably say, yeah, sure, yeah, that's also a good idea. Um, is failure bad? And most of us would say, sure, it's failure, of course, it sucks, it's bad, but is it always bad? Um, I would say, no, like failure, as you, uh, go ahead, so I have some transitions, that keep going. Um, but we learn from failure, right? Uh, failure, in a lot of cases, is what teaches us to succeed. So um, even though we have it set in our mind as this persistently negative thing, it's really not always negative. And that's why I called this everything is good and everything is bad. Um, the problem is that we tend to focus on too narrow of a, a, a scope of the whole uh, issue to really understand that at a fundamental level. So the book this is all taken from is called David and Goliath, and it's actually named because one of the principles of th that this comes from, one of the big examples in the book, is in fact the actual story of David and Goliath. Um, so 
the whole thing takes place. We know the story, right? Uh, Goliath is this huge giant. Little shepherd boy David fights him uh, like thousands of years ago and somehow overcomes, right? Um, Goliath is this giant. Um, at conservative estimates, he's six foot nine, so he's at least a full foot taller than I am. Um, he has this giant sword, this giant spear, this giant shield. Uh, that body armor that, if it's described accurately, probably weighed 300 pounds or more. Uh, and obviously, he's got to be just brutally strong to carry this thing. Um, and the, uh, where the story goes that he had an attendant that carried a shield before him. Like, this is how big his shield was. It, an attendant walked before him, carrying it into battle for him. Um, so the way this worked was he was in this army of the Philistines, and there was this other army uh, of the Israelites. And um, it was common in ancient times, and even through like the Roman era, for uh, rather than the entire armies to fight each other, for the armies to just challenge each other to one-on-one -on -one combat. And that's what you do if you have somebody like Goliath on your team. You're like, yeah, send that guy in there. Let him fight. Uh, and whatever poor chump is on the other side is going to lose. Uh, nobody would dare actually face this guy for obvious reasons. He's massive, he's huge, he's like just armored, decked out head to toe. Um, the, the spear he carried could probably actually pierce a shield in his hands. It was so big and he was so strong. But um, David was willing to fight him. And, and we, the, uh, the whole idea of the story is that we get this confrontation wrong. And the whole idea of the book is that when we look at these situations where an underdog is going up against a giant or a favorite, um, we get those stories wrong. And what we see as objective strength is oftentimes not at all that simple. Um, so Goliath, and as, as any giant is going to be, as, as this is the idea of the book, he's ready for the battle to be fought on his terms. He's anticipating a close combat fight. Um, it isn't a story about this underdog like miraculously felling a giant with a slingshot. Okay, that's somehow become the narrative. That's not at all what this story is about. Um, that's not it. That's not what actually happened. The whole thing is that David actually was able to fight the giant on his own terms. And giants are not what we think they are when we dare to fight them on our own terms. Uh, I found this stock photo, and I think it's just hilarious because it's so terrible. But it also really greatly summarizes what we've come to think of this story as. Like, in order for this wimpy little business guy, he doesn't even have a jacket. Uh, in order for him to win, like, something impossible is going to have to happen, right? And that's what we think this story is about. But that's not it at all. Um, the, the thing that, we, that has gotten kind of lost is that, uh, so, I, I, told, I talked a lot about Goliath and all of his armor, and if you tried to go up against him and fight him his way with an actual sword and shield, you would probably lose. The story is that David wasn't armed with some child's toy, not with a slingshot, but with an actual sling. It was a cord that you held both ends of your hand, you put a rock in it, and you twirled it above your head, and you could actually launch a stone at just absolutely deadly velocity, like literally comparative to a handgun. Um, the, there are historical examples of people like shooting birds out of the sky with this weapon. Um, in the olden days, it was kind of a battle between infantry, cavalry, and artillery, right? Goliath is um, infantry, he, and he's the, the sort of ultimate infantry warrior, and everybody sa saw him and said, there's no way I can beat this guy, but the reality is, it, when you're that big, when you're that heavy, you are an absolute sitting duck for somebody who is artillery. Uh, the world record for a, um, a sling thrower that we have recorded is a football field and a half in distance for how fast a stone could go. And it can go like faster than a major league pitcher can throw a ball. But it's often not a ball. It's a stone or a, a lead um, ball that's been made. So, this is an absolute deadly weapon in the right hands. Um, this, the, the story isn't that a miracle happened. The story is that somebody looked past all of the strengths and saw the weakness. There's a really cool thing in the book it talks about also where um, ever, anybody know Andre the Giant? Like the, yeah, the, the WWF wrestler? Um, 
he, his size was because of a um, pituitary issue, um, which is kind of rare, but uh, it's, it's known now. A lot of people in the world have it. It causes you to grow uh, extremely large, and a lot of people think that this is what Goliath actually had, because um, not only does it cause you to grow very large, but it presses up against the, uh, the gland grows so large it presses up against the front of your skull and causes you, in uh, a lot of cases, to have bad vision. Um, the story of David and Goliath, if you read closely, the book talks about how he clearly had bad vision. In fact, uh, it's kind of assumed now that the reason somebody carried his shield before him wasn't because he couldn't carry it. He was a giant. Of course he could carry his own shield. It was because he needed somebody to lead him to the battlefield because his vision was bad. And uh, he actually addresses David a couple of times and says things like, why are you coming at with me with sticks? And David doesn't have sticks. He has a sling. Um, that does that, and it also weakens the frontal part of your skull as you grow. So that's the story, and that's how we get it wrong. And everybody else sees the stronger Goliath is, the more indestructible he is. The bigger, the stronger, the better, OK? But that's almost never true. And the opposite is almost never true as well, uh, where the less, the better. Uh, we still see giants this way, because the more stronger, the more invincible they are. Uh, and we still see underdogs this way, even though that's almost never true either. Um, but we still see those impossible odds um, with those small people. Uh, the reality is that life doesn't operate on an x equals y scale. Life operates on a, sc a scale called the inverted u where if you're in one place, the more the better is true. But it depends how much you have, where you are, how much you need, and whether it's actually a good thing for you to have more, or whether you're actually starting to turn that strength into a weakness or turn that weakness into a strength. If you're curious, the mathematical formula is roughly equivalent to x squared equals negative 2y. Uh, nobody's interested. Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> But good and bad, advantages and disadvantages, positives and negatives, these things are not opposites. They are two sides of the same continuum. Um, what we think, the more of this is the better. But the reality is we're just looking at a very small portion of the actual scale when we think that. Uh, maybe we're all the way on the left on the bottom. Maybe we're not quite to the top. But we aren't seeing the overall. We're just seeing that left side. And when we see, like, OK, the less of this I have, the better, what we're actually seeing is the opposite. What we're actually seeing is the other side. Uh, the less, the better isn't. It's true for maybe if I'm here on this scale, it's true. But it's not objectively universally true. Uh, go ahead. So. Everything is good up to a point, and everything is bad up to a point. Uh, the inverted U. Everything in life, pretty much, follows this example. Uh, it's good to a point, it's bad to a point. If you're down here, the more you have, the better. At the next, uh, if you start moving on up the scale, more is still better, but it, we're starting to hit the point of diminishing returns. The bigger I am, the stronger I am, the less stress I have, the more money I have, whatever. It doesn't make as much of a difference as it used to. And then eventually, we start getting to a point where we start being counterproductive. And we're actually hurting ourselves by having more. And we're turning our strengths into weaknesses. And the more we have, the worse at a certain point. We've actually flipped the scale on its head. Uh, an example from the book talks about, uh, actually, the, the guy he talks about is a, a Hollywood big shot. And the example is, does having money make it easier to raise a child? Most of us in this room would probably say, yeah, I could use more money. If I'm going to raise a kid, if I'm going to give my kids uh, the best experience that they can have, hell yeah, I need more money. The reality is, yeah, if we're over here, then yes, the more money we have, the better. A little bit of money makes a big difference for us if we're over here. But there's a certain point where having more money stops actually making raising a child easier and stops contributing to their welfare and to their benefit and to their happiness. Uh, if I'm recalling correctly, I believe at the time of the publishing of the book, that was somewhere around like $75,000 per household. It's probably gone up a little bit now. But at a certain point, you start having more money, and it starts getting harder to raise a kid. Um, 
this Hollywood uh, big shot was talking about how he grew up in a poor family and he learned the value of hard work. He learned uh, why his parents said no to him. His parents could say no to him. They had to say no to him. And he learned that if he wanted to make something happen, he had to do it himself. And he struggled with teaching those lessons to his kids because he's got millions of dollars. He's got a, a Ferrari. And like, yeah, okay, we're not going to feel bad for that guy. But at the same time, like, we don't realize that there is a point where we are actually, the thing that we previously thought of as an advantage starts to become a disadvantage. Uh, and eventually it just goes off the deep end and the more we have of it, the worse, the more self-destructive. Um, good and bad, the truth is not that simple ever. Um, let's see, go ahead. Yeah, so, we're a little behind here on the slides, sorry. Uh, so things like this, uh, there's a couple more. Fat is bad for you, company growth is good, procrastination is bad, uh, you gotta be constantly hustling, that's the way to do it, that's always good. These are not exactly true. These all adhere to that inverted U scale as well. Uh, at a certain point, yeah, the more the better. At a, uh, going beyond that, you, it starts to be diminishing returns. Um, I can, hustling is great, but if I'm doing too much of it, I'm wearing myself out. I'm, I'm just wearing thin. If I start going beyond that point, then I'm actually hurting myself, and eventually I'm just being completely self-destructive with any of those things, and it works the opposite way too. Like these bad things, maybe they're actually good in small doses, and we have to get beyond thinking of things in that binary good and bad way. Um, we consider ourselves and our choices in terms of strengths and weaknesses, but uh, the same principle applies to both. Strength starts being a weakness when it goes too far on that curve, and a weakness isn't actually always a disadvantage. Um, another example from the book is, is going to a prestigious school an advantage? And most of us would say, yeah, we think of names like Harvard and Yale and MIT as these um, huge advantages, and we think of them in this way. The more prestigious the school, the higher our likelihood of success. Um, but an interesting thing comes out if you look at it. Um, he tells a story of a, a, a woman who went to Brown and eventually wound up, uh, she entered the STEM field and she eventually wound up dropping out. Um, an interesting thing happens if you compare like the highest of prestigious schools with those that are below them, like a Harvard versus a Hartwick College. Uh, you find that the worst Harvard STEM students have an average SAT score of 581. Okay, so the worst people at Harvard have this score. And this is still a really damn good score. But they're the worst students at Harvard. And because of that, because they're in this field where uh, there are just so many people smarter than they are above them, they tend to just drop out. Even though they're way, way, way above where most people anywhere else are. By contrast, uh, the best STEM students at Hartwick tend to have an SAT score of around 569. That is worse than the absolute worst at Harvard. But these students actually go on to have successful jobs in their careers because they are the biggest fish in their pond. So we think of it in terms of the more prestigious, the higher the likelihood of success. But again, it follows that inverted U. The likelihood, uh, you need a good school, but you don't need the best school unless you are one of the absolute best at that school. Um, it's called the Big Fish Little Pond uh, in the book, and it's really, really, it's really fascinating. Um, sometimes you beat a giant by refusing to play by their rules, and sometimes that means going into a different pond than they are in and being a bigger fish in that pond. Uh, what about the size of our business? We tend to think that this is an advantage. I'm just gonna kinda skim through this real fast, but uh, that's not always an advantage. Uh, it follows the same U curve. Like, as businesses get bigger, they find it harder to scale, they find it tougher to hire the right people, to maintain a culture, to uh, uh, move quickly, to implement uh, new ideas and software and technology. All this stuff actually becomes um, tough after a while. I work in customer support, like I said, at Flywheel. Um, I joined when the team was very small. I was among the first hires on my team, and I, uh, when I started, we were really small. We had to figure out really tough problems ourselves because we didn't have anybody else to rely on, right? We were super tiny. Um, I thought that was a disadvantage, but really, it actually wasn't because um, we learned to be scrappy. We shared, we helped each other, we leveled up. I thought that X was equal to Y. The more 
people we had on our team, the better. But uh, the reality is that big teams face challenges that small teams don't. And as we've grown, our ability to scale and figuring out how we take the way we grew to a larger team has been a really, really big challenge. Um, every strength, just remember, this is kind of the takeaway. Every strength is actually just a weakness on the right side of the chart. And every weakness is actually just a strength to the right side of the chart. Uh, this is a really cool example. Um, so here's a name, a, a list of names that you probably recognize. Uh, all of these people are ridiculously successful people in their fields, particularly in business. The president of Goldman Sachs, Steven Spielberg, Richard Branson, Charles Schwab, the founder of IKEA, founder of JetBlue, CEO of Cisco, founder of Kinkos. What these guys have in common is that they, are, every single one of them is dyslexic. And it turns out that dyslexia in particular and learning disabilities in general are actually extremely common among ultra, like super successful business people, entrepreneurs, and investors. Um, we tend to think of this way, right? The, the, the fewer disadvantages you have, the more likely you are to have some success. But it turns out that some struggle, some friction, some challenge is actually, in a lot of cases, what helps us get to that successful point. Um, so a persistent trait of successful innovators is the willingness to accept social risk, to do things that uh, a lot of us would be afraid to do because we don't want to face the consequences if we fail at that thing. Um, turns out, when you grow up with a learning disability, you get over that fear really fast because your entire life is social risk. Um, you're used to pretending to be somebody you're not in a lot of cases. Uh, the, the, the book tells an awesome story about how uh, the guy who's now the, the president of Goldman Sachs, uh, he got his job by hopping in a cab with somebody who worked there and lying about who he was. Over the weekend, he read a book, he got a job, and now he's the president. None of us would do that, probably, but he did it because he was absolutely unafraid to do it. What did he have to lose? Uh, that advantage, that challenge, actually made him listen well and accept social risk. Um, that's not to say a disadvantage is always an advantage, right? It's, it's you know, a, a, a lot of people face that struggle and they don't have the same outcomes. But every advantage is a disadvantage on the other side of the spectrum. He said, I wouldn't be where I am today without my dyslexia. I never would have taken that first chance. Just an interesting story. Um, Underdogs win because a lot of times they're the only ones desperate enough to do what it's going to take to beat that giant. Uh, and a lot of times giants fall because they don't expect anybody to try that thing. Um, there's a really cool story about uh, the full court press in basketball and a coach of a 10-year-old uh, girls basketball team who just got his team to adopt this impossible strategy. This it was exhausting and painful because they weren't good, but they were desperate enough to try it and they got uh, they made it all the way to the championships because they were the underdogs who were desperate enough to try that strategy. Um, I don't think I, uh, and, and like opposite is true a lot of times. Like we know tons of gifted children and prodigies and stuff who don't live up to the promise, right? So the advantage is sort of a disadvantage almost in some ways. I don't think I'm going to have time to actually finish this, uh, but that's okay. I'll wrap it up here in a minute. Um, a lot of times gifted children come from highly supportive family backgrounds. And that's a good thing. That is an advantage, and that's something that everybody should have. But a lot of times, that means uh, he, a psychologist named Dean Simonton is quoted as saying this in the book. Um, two con these children uh, who are very gifted, a lot of times, they're too conventional. They're too obedient. They're too unimaginative to make the big time with some revolutionary idea. In contrast, geniuses have a perverse tendency of coming from more adverse conditions. Every advantage is a disadvantage. Every disadvantage is an advantage. We think of things in this way, but the reality is that a certain amount of support is important, and you've got to have that in your life. But at a certain point, it may not be the most important thing anymore, and it may actually be counterproductive for you. So uh, you could ask this question. Was Einstein's childhood hard because he was a genius, or was Einstein a genius because his childhood was hard? I'm going to stop the slides there. Um, I, there's not much more left, but I just want us to think about, like, when we're making decisions, when we're facing these choices in our lives, remember, a, a lot of times we're chasing that upward slope. A lot of times we're chasing that the more the better. Uh, when the reality is it's a slider, and we're aiming for somewhere in the middle. On the one end is an extreme bad, on the other end is an extreme bad, but we have to be conscious that everything 
turns upside down after a certain point. And our advantages can be disadvantages, our disadvantages can be advantages, and it's recognizing that both internally in our own selves and the things we fight for and the decisions we make, as well as the giants that we look out there in the world and, and see as unconquerable foes, um, those things can be easily flipped at any time. So the book is called David and Goliath. It's by Malcolm Gladwell. It's really good. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's made me think about the world in a different way, and there are many, many awesome stories from it that I haven't gotten the chance to tell here. So uh, check it out. Thank you.